All right. Thanks, Dr. Chu. Let me just make sure I'm, I'm unmuted, so I'm good. So first off, thanks to everybody for tuning in today uh, for a discussion around asymptomatic renal stones. And as Dr. Chu mentioned, I think it is quite an interesting topic because you really have to really look at the data to kind of walk that balance behind um, doing no harm and helping patients work through their stone disease and to mitigate their risk. So hopefully today, what we can, what we'll achieve is we'll go through some of the latest data on the natural history of non-obstructing renal stones, and then afterwards transition to compare and contrast the different modalities and treatment options available for these patients, looking at their efficacy, the morbidities of the different treatments, and what quality of life means for these patients who elect for these different types of management. The last thing we'll do is we'll go through new trends in the endourologic management of renal stones and to look at some of the new upcoming exciting treatment approaches that might change this disease space. So as we all know, stone disease is very common and very prevalent, especially in North America. In the United States, cost figures estimate that over $2 billion in healthcare spending goes towards the treatment of stone disease in the United States alone. And this number, and also this prevalence number I anticipate is gonna continue to increase as we see increased uptake of cross-sectional imaging, and detection methods improve, and with the increased incidence of metabolic syndrome, which we know is strongly associated with stone disease. In this study below, which was a landmark study on the epidemiology of stone disease, we see a screening prevalence of about 8 to 10 percent. And this patient population done here was patients are completely asymptomatic. So patients who had CT colonographies just for colon cancer screening, and in this population, about 10 percent were found to have a non-obstructing stone on CT. Most only had one stone, and the majority of these were under seven millimeters. The big question that comes to us as urologists is, how do we manage all of these stones? These patients are clearly not symptomatic. The question becomes, is it safe to leave these patients simply alone? Is it safe to watch them? Um, if we watch them, what is their likelihood of getting a symptomatic event? Are their stones likely to grow or stay the same? Maybe they might pass them on their own. These are all questions that are reasonable ones to ask. The other question to ask is, are patients going to be happier if we prophylactically treat their stone disease? Or do they prefer to take the risk and watch and wait? The next few, I guess, the next few slides will go through some of the data around these. But I think it's interesting to look at what the different guidelines first say on the management of asymptomatic stones. And honestly, they don't really give us much guidance. There are statements from the AUA and statements from the EAU. The AUA says that patients with asymptomatic non-obstructing calocele stones, clinicians can offer active surveillance, but this is a conditional recommendation. The EAU also, light in a similar sort of tone, says that observation of renal stones, especially the calices, can be offered, but depends on the natural history of the particular stone in question, and that the recommendations that are provided are not supported by high-level literature. One of the first earlier studies that's often cited looking at the natural history of non-obstructing stones is this retrospective review from 1992, which looks at about 110 patients with asymptomatic non-obstructing stones over a follow-up of about two and a half years. And the mean stone size here is about four millimeters. They estimate a risk of a stone-related event of being about 10% per year of follow-up. So in this study, they define a stone-related event as either a past stone that led to symptoms or a patient that required an endourologic intervention, meaning shockwave, ureteroscopy, or PCNL. The total number was about one-third of patients at the two-and-a-half-year mark needed or had some form of stone-related event. There's a pretty significant number over a short follow-up period. The challenge with looking at this sort of data is it's not necessarily clear-cut. We have some studies which show a very high rate of intervention in stone-related events, and we have other ones like this, which is a more recent retrospective review from 2018, which provides an argument for the converse. This was a retrospective study, I think based out of China with 290 patients who had non-obstructing stones. And they reported stone-related events of about 60% at four years. But one of the stone-related events that they report, they consider is actually spontaneous passage. And in their group, 
they say that about 33% or 32% of all of these patients actually end up spontaneously passing their stone on their own without any intervention at a mean of four years of follow-up. And if I did my math right, about 20% of those patients actually had no symptoms at all and just happened to spontaneously pass that fragment. Despite that higher number than I would have expected, still about 28% had symptoms at some point over the follow-up of the retrospective study, 12% needed some form of intervention, and 17% had evidence of stone growth on follow-up imaging. Sorry, can I ask a question about that study? Yep. Of course. What imaging modality were they using? The qu reason I have that question yeah. is, uh, as you know, on ultrasound, you can sometimes find fragments that don't turn out to be there. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering if any of that asymptomatic stone passage could have been from uh, artifacts that then disappeared on subsequent images. Yeah, it, that's a great question. It absolutely could be. This was a mostly ultrasound KUB with interspersed CT. So you're absolutely right. That's part of the challenge, I think, with stone literature is like the imaging modality, the follow-up time, um, all these things factor in and will dictate differences in results. I think that's a really important point, Cyrus. I, I don't think this would be acceptable in something like oncology. It's like, oh, I don't know, you know, you might have a tumor, you might not have a tumor. I, I, we're not really sure. I mean, this is kind of what ultrasound is like. And I think it's one of the um, terrible things about stone not only stone clinically, but basically stone research as well, too, because, uh, you know, advocating for studies at one point where they only wanted CT follow-up was just a little bit ridiculous in terms of you pluck out a six millimeter UVJ stone, but are you going to radiate the patient again just to prove that they're stone free for a study? It, it just, it's a little bit ridiculous. Exactly. I think we'll see some better quality data as we go through with the RCTs that are more stringent about CTs as we come through. Uh, some of the other data, especially the Lingaman trial coming up. No, I agree. And it's a big challenge that I find very difficult when interpreting stone literature. Um, we do have a more recent meta-analysis from 2022 that put together 10 studies uh, looking at mostly adults with asymptomatic stones, but also included some patients who had residual fragments after um, ureteroscopy or PCNL that measured less than 10 millimeters. And kind of echoing some of that heterogeneity that we discussed earlier, they say the risk of symptoms in this patient population range from zero to 60%. The risk of an admission, say to the emergency department for stone symptoms was anywhere from 14 to 19%. And the risk of any intervention ranged from 12 to 35. When they looked at whether stone size correlated with any of these, interestingly, st stone size didn't correlate with the risk of developing symptoms but it did associate with the risk of needing an intervention over the follow-up period. Another common question that I think we get asked as urologists is, can non-obstructing stones be a cause for recurrent infections? And is that a reason to consider treating them? And this was data that came out of Cleveland Clinic that looked at 120 patients with recurrent UTIs who were treated for asymptomatic stones to try and render them free of infection. And interestingly, this showed that 50% of patients were infection-free, um, meaning it cleared their positive urine cultures after treatment of the non-obstructing stone. So I think if this question gets posed to us, I think it's reasonable to consider treatment of non-obstructing stones to render a patient rec recurrent UTIs free of uh, recurrent infections, with an understanding that it only occurs 50% of the time based off this data. Can I put in a plug? There's um, a session at the AUA called Second Opinion and talk about controversial cases like this. And, and uh, Manoj Manga, Kamora Scotland and myself will be uh, kind of debating this, um, this exact topic. Does getting rid of this asymptomatic stone get rid of this person's UTIs? I have, a, I, have a, I have a comment on that study. The best available data um, is from this study and another, uh, which I believe Crambeck was on. And the limitation of the existing literature is they're both retrospective. And if you look at the inclusion criteria, the way that um, UTI was defined is not is not that well set out. So, you know, I can't you can't really tell was it patient reported with a documented, you know, because the definition of UTI is patient reported with documented symptoms in a positive culture. And it seems like some of many of the patients who were included might have been history. Recurrent UTI is typically defined as two and six months or three and one year. 
And although patients may have had that according to history, you know from seeing patients in clinic that it's often not recorded uh, uh, and documented, and it may just be patients who had some symptoms. It's not clear if they really had a UTI. And then they're being observed in a stone clinic because they had their stone taken out. So you, there's no comparison group as well. It's looking only at patients who had their stones removed pre and post UTI occurrence. And you don't know if there's a cohort whose UTIs would have gotten better anyway because they just had a blip where they had two or three in a year. So I think the data, I mean, it'll be interesting to see what the session is at the AUA as well. But personally, I think the data there is, um, you know, you have to go on what's the best available, but fairly weak uh, for drawing a strong conclusion. And there's a, a real need for some additional studies in that area, in my opinion. So, so Connor has spearheaded a uh, prospective study and looking and this multi-center study uh, that he started to Vanderbilt that he's carried on to here and now he's still the PI and he's looking at whether or not treating a stone will get rid of a recurrent UTI or not. So this will give us the, the I think, the most definitive data given that it's prospective. Um, it is not randomized, but still at least we'll collect all the data prospectively. Yeah. But that That is an excellent point, though, because this study, the patients would have just only needed to be included with just a history of recurrent UTI. Um, to be included. So that's that's a definitely a very valid point. Can I ask you a question, Cyrus? Sorry. Yeah, of course. Um, I, I'm out of my field, but I had the, the, the memory that uh, culture from the bladder might not correlate to the culture of the stone if we talk about, for example, uh, a struvitz cal, uh, a stone. Is it possible yes. that clearing out a recurrent UTI may not be related to what actually compose, you know, is found in the pelvis? And in the question we'll be following is that those studies, were they done with bladder culture or um, pelvic? Pelvis yeah, so so this particular study, to be included, you only had to have had a history of recurrent UTI. You did not necessarily have to have, I think, a preoperative positive urine culture. And then um, afterwards, they just did screening urine cultures after treatment of the stone. And they showed that half of patients had persistently negative urine cultures after treatment of the stone. So again, it is weaker-ish sort of data, but one of the only studies that we really have to weigh in on this. I know it doesn't really answer the question per se, but it's um, it's an area, it's a space that does need more further discussion and study for sure. Um, moving on to look at the, there's a recent randomized controlled trial from the New England Journal of Medicine that I think takes a different spin on the same question where we want to say what happens to asymptomatic stone patients. This was a very interesting trial that was spearheaded by University of Washington that took patients who are going to get a ureteroscopy or PCNL anyways for another index stone. So it could have been an obstructing ureteral stone or it could have been a significant stone burden on another side, which they were definitely, their decision was made, they're going to get intervention for that stone burden. But to be included in this study, most of the patients had contralateral, smaller, like three, four millimeter non-obstructing stones. And they randomized these patients to either concurrent ureteroscopy to treat those non-obstructing stones on the other renal unit or observation. And then they looked at um, stone-related relapse, which they defined as progression on CT at three months, greater than one millimeter, repeat surgery on the trial side, or an emergency department presentation for stone-related events to the trial, uh, the tr clinical trial side. And this data was quite interesting. They showed a very significantly increased risk of relapse uh, for stone-related events in the control group compared to the treatment group. Treatment group meaning the ones who got ureteroscopy for those non-obstructing stones. They showed that there was no difference in early emergency department visits two weeks after surgery between those who had the extra ureteroscopy and those who did not. And they showed the treatment of the non-obstructing stones only added minimal OR time, about a median of 25 minutes, and gave you this significant uh, re reduction in risk of relapse. They further stratified their data and said, well, you know, one millimeter is a pretty stringent cutoff for stone growth. What if we take stone growth out of the equation? And you do see a preserved effect where the treatment group had a much lower incidence of stone-related progression compared to the control. Or the treatment group had a lower risk of stone-related relapse compared to the control group. 
So I think when we look at this data as a purist, you can say this supports treating other non-obstructing stones in patients with multifocal stones for getting ureteroscopy or PCNL. But I think we can also make an extension of this data to say this does support treating asymptomatic non-obstructing stones because it demonstrates in an RCT sort of setting that we can actually reduce uh, risk of stone-related events. To gain more insight into the importance of being stone-free, there's relatively much more literature in the space of patients who've had ureteroscopy or PCNL looking at the fate of residual fragments there. This is an earlier meta-analysis looking at uh, various stone sizes and various follow-up times. And we can see that even small fragments post-intervention do carry significant risks of needing re-intervention, ranging anywhere from, say, 15 up to 50, 60%. Again, this depends on the size and depends on the duration of follow-up. Recent data that's impressed from the EDGE Consortium, uh, spearheaded here at UBC by Dr. Chu's group, has looked at the risk of needing surgery, uh, or sorry, stone-related events after PCNL. And in patients who after PCNL have fragments that are greater than four millimeters, at about three years, you almost certainly have the risk of incurring a stone-related event. So this data in the post-treatment space does su potentially support a role for active treatment in patients who have asymptomatic stones that are non-obstructing. The question here, I think, is sure, there is potentially substantial risk to patients, but can we somehow predict which patients are going to be at higher risk for needing a stone-related procedure or having significant symptoms for their asymptomatic stones? This retrospective review from 2022 looked at 270 renal units over a follow-up of four years, and they defined a stone event rate of 45% over this follow-up. They looked at factors that are easily discernible on CT scan, and the factors that were associated with increased risk of stone-related morbidity were first stone location, so stone in the interpolar or upper pole region were more likely to cause stone-related morbidity, and stones greater than five millimeters were more likely to cause problems. Amy Krambeck's group also tried to look at total stone volume measured by a CT-guided algorithm by, to look at whether this predicted risk for stone-related events. And they did this by pulling back CTKUBs, identifying the patients, and then sending them questionnaires to see who had stone-related events, treatments, and so forth several years after. And they showed a nice sort of stepwise increase in risk for stone-related events as your total stone volume increased to the point where if your total stone volume was greater than 1,000 millimeters cubed, you had almost 80% risk of having a stone-related event by six years. So if we kind of put this all together, what I think we can take away right now is that patients with asymptomatic stones are certainly at risk for stone-related events over their lifetime. I think it's fair to say the greater the stone burden, the more likely one is to experience a stone-related event. And ultimately, it's going to come down to patients to decide whether they prefer to take a more proactive or a reactive approach to managing their stone disease. Deciding on one or the other will depend on the risks and benefits of the treatment compared to the uncertainties of these patients being on observations. That uncertainty is going to mean different things to different patients. Some might be very anxious about having to deal with severe pain. Some may not want to deal with more invasive treatments should the stone progress. And all this will depend on a patient's individual values. Can you go back? I, I think this is really important. And I think this is why the guidelines are just so hard because there's just not a one size fits all approach. And, and you know, you're talking about, um, you know, someone who's 85 and retired and just kind of puttering around the city. That's quite different from a 35 year old who travels for work. So, and then also, you know, you get into this, I just can't stand the thought of having this thing in there. Um, it, this is why, you know, I think this is quite a difficult guideline to have. And some of the guidelines are just sometimes ammunition for, um, you know, lawsuits. Why didn't you take this out? Then I experienced this horrible event, especially in the States. But uh, so th this is why I think this is uh, interesting. And I think the, the, the art part of medicine and particularly in stones, and this highlights it quite well. Absolutely. And I think to segue into the next piece, I think we have to really go through and flush out the pros and cons of SWELL and ureteroscopy and compare that to observation. 
is most of these stones, PCNL is really out of the equation because we're really talking about stones that are less than 10 millimeters here. We're all quite familiar with SWL and ureteroscopy as urologists. And the general takeaway, I think, for these different treatments is SWL is thought to be the less invasive modality associated with a shorter recovery time, but may come with lower stone free rates compared to ureteroscopy. Ureteroscopy, as we know, is more invasive, requires a general anesthetic, and in most cases will require placement of a stent, but carries that dreaded risk for uteral injury and stricture, albeit low. But despite these things, can provide patients with a higher stone free rate. If you look at ESWL, ESWL has been around since the 1980s, and stone free rates from those from data at that time is roughly between 50 to 70 percent. Factors that we see associated with worse outcomes are stone sizes greater than two centimeters, lower pole stones, dense stones, stones that are greater than 1,000 to 1,200 pounds field units. And also patients who have larger skin to stone distances. So usually we think greater than 10 centimeters associated with a poorer outcome simply because it's more depth for the shock wave to penetrate. The risks that come with the SWL to quickly go through these, we have a risk of Steinstrasse, meaning multiple small fragments that get impacted in the ureter, about one to 10%. Again, depends on the stone size being treated. Risk of sepsis is about one to 2%. Perinephric hematoma, one to four. And an arrhythmia is up to 15%, but usually these arrhythmias are just PVCs, so completely benign and nothing of concern. Initially, when ESWL came out, there were concerns about it being associated with hypertension, diabetes, infertility, and even chronic kidney disease, but none of these associations have been demonstrated to date. We actually have an RCT that randomized patients with asymptomatic calyceal stones under 15 millimeters to either upfront shockwave or observation and follow them over two to three years. This study was quite interesting in that, although it demonstrated significant improvement in the KUB X-ray in these patients, it didn't show a significant reduction in the need for additional treatment, additional analgesia, or even the overall stone free rate for patients. But what it did demonstrate is that the patients in the ESWL group did not require any invasive treatments at all over the course of the follow-up. Versus in the observation group, there was a total of, I believe, 12 invasive treatments in nine patients. So even though it did not show a difference in stone free rate or requirement in, say, early readmissions, GP visits, or early analgesia requirements. It did prevent the need for invasive treatments later on. So if you have the patient that you know is very adverse to stents, very worried about ureteroscopy, it does demonstrate that SVAL might be a good option for these patients in the long run. The only caution I give in interpreting this data is it wasn't able to show a significant difference in the stone free rate. Um, in the trial. Moving I, on to- That's a funny thing though, isn't it? I, I know. Like, that's my okay, so you're going to get treatment and you're not going to get treatment. And by the way, the stone free rate's the same, whether you get treatment or not. What? <laughs> like, so the, the way that I take this data that I present it, because this, you know, it's funny, this is 21 years ago and it's still the best um, prospective randomized trial we have of treating asymptomatic stones up until now, I guess. And still, um, you know, this study was even bigger than the New England Journal one. But um, I tell patients, you know, the, the, the study showed that your stone free rate is the same. But if you leave it in this study, you were more likely to uh, receive more invasive therapy, i.e. ureteroscopy. So that's that's the only thing I think that we can kind of gather from this. But, um, you know, I, I think this has to be taken into the asymptomatic calocele stone range. And remember, this is also ureteroscopy 21 years ago as well, too. So this is a little bit different. But shockwave probably have re has remained the same. I don't think the improvements have been that much. But um, that's just something to keep in mind that... Uh, this data is probably still relevant now and not for all stones, but just for asymptomatic calocele stones. I, I think it also, like you get a lot of those patients who may have had ureteroscopy before they had a terrible experience with their stent. I think this provides good ammunition to say, well, I think shockwave is a good option for you. I, I think. Um, moving on to ureteroscopy here. So ureteroscopy, 
know, it's been around and like Dr. Chu said, I think has seen significant gains, especially in the past five to 10 years with the advent of better laser technology, Thulium, Moses, better scope imaging technology. Um, stone free rates again, ultra by stone size, the location, and really what definition we are using of stone of stone free. Um, some studies say completely clean CTs. Some use ultrasound. Some will have a definition of minimal, significant uh, stone size post ureteroscopy. But in general, from what I gathered, if you're looking at stone size of less than two centimeters, if you go off CT, about a 55% stone free rate post ureteroscopy, meaning like a completely clean CT scan. And if you go by ultrasound KUB, probably 70 to 90% stone free rate. The risks of ureteroscopy, and it's going to have higher morbidities compared to ESWL. So risk of fever or sepsis is going to range in 0.2 to 15%. Stricture, 1 to 3%. The dreaded ureteric injury, 1 to 4%. The risk for urinary retention is 0.1 to 1%. Stent colic, anywhere from 50 to 90 Steinstrasse up to 2.5 and difficult ureteral access, meaning that you're unable to get up the ureter due to a tight UO, for example, needing stenting and a repeat procedure. It's anywhere from 1% to 40%. And I think this paper back from 2013, which looked at ureteric injuries and staging ureteric injuries with access sheath placement and ureteroscopy, really highlights that ureteral injuries are common and ureteroscopy is not benign. This was a study published by Olivier Traxer in France from 2013. And what he did is he actually wanted to grade and look at ureteric injuries after access sheath placement. So he would pull back the access sheath after ureteroscopy, inspect the ureter and assign a grade. And this grading system went from one to um, five, I mean, one being just a small, you know, mucosal abrasion to three being like a greater than, sorry, less than 50% uh, thickness injury to the ureter, to five being like a complete avulsion. Two, two and above were considered high-grade ureteric injuries, meaning they needed greater than three weeks of ureteric stenting. And one, you wouldn't have to do anything different. So a grade one injury occurred in about 40% of these cases, and a high grade occurred in 6% of cases. Interestingly, there's no data out there that I could come across that actually associated a high risk ureteric injury based off the scale with ultimate stricture formation. But these patients would have to be managed with prolonged stenting afterwards, which adds ex extra morbidity after ureteroscopy. I mean, just something to keep in mind. Another study I wanted to go through comparing ureteroscopy to ESWL is a landmark study published by Peggy Pearl in 2005 which randomized 76 patients with lower pole stones, less than one centimeter to either ureteroscopy or ESWL. These patients had pretty stringent follow-up and had a three month CT afterwards and then looked at their stone free rates. The stone free rates interestingly were not statistically significant or there was no significant difference between stone free rates in ESWL and ureteroscopy, but there was a trend towards improved stone free rates in the URS group compared to shockwave, 50% for URS, 35% for shockwave. An interesting takeaway though from the study is that the patients who had shockwave went back to work on average five days sooner than ureteroscopy. And 90% of patients would choose shockwave again compared to only 60% of the ureteroscopy patients, which tells me, and I think gives us a bit of a signal here that perhaps patients are willing to settle for a lower stone free rate in exchange for greater morbid or for lesser morbidities and a shorter recovery. Echoing this sentiment, there is a study published back in 2018 out of Japan, which looked at both stone free rates and also quality of life prospectively in patients who are having ureteroscopy and, or shockwave. And they looked at 260 patients. The only caveat with this group is some of these patients, I think about half of them had ureteric stones and half were seal stones. They showed that ureteroscopy, while had significant improvements in stone free rates, um, although I will say the proportion was not much different by three months, only about 4%. The patients who had shockwave had significantly better quality of life um, over the six month period of the study across multiple domains of the SF36 questionnaire, I mean, physical function, physical health, social function, and emotional and mental health domains. 
So that, that's interesting because that makes sense if you're going to, um, you know, talk about it in the first 30 days or even the first week or even 30 days because you got a stent, you got to take it out. It's a real pain from your uteroscopy. But why was it, you know, why would this project out to six months? It, that, that's, that's the weird thing that strikes me about this paper. And just interesting. I think there are some long-term effects from having a stent and having your reteroscopy, whereas shockwave, um, you, know, you got to weigh that. So yeah, you have a higher stone free rate with your uh, reteroscopy, but people feel better with shockwave, even though they don't have as high a stone free rate. Yeah. I think it's, I think it goes into, you know, the concept of reteroscopy. You're having a full GA, you're having a surgery, you're having all that versus your shockwave. It's, basically thought of as like a procedure, more like, and I equate it to something like colonoscopy, upper endoscopy. I think in patients' minds, they think and conceptualize shockwave is different than your ureteroscopy. Yeah. I think this sentiment also translates when different groups have done studies to look at what patients would want when they approach them with different scenarios. So this was a study published in last year where they recruited patients via social media through social Facebook groups. And I'm not exactly sure how they identified them, but it was through social media. But they distributed them, distributed them a poster, giving them different scenarios and different stone free rates and risks and all that of either shockwave observation, uh, ureteroscopy or PCNL for the larger stone size. But more relevant to us is this eight millimeter category. And they said, you know, if you've got an eight, eight millimeter uh, lower pole stone, non-obstructing, this is the data and risks for observation, shockwave, or ureteroscopy, what would you choose? And most of the patients across all of the age groups were actually electing for shockwave, as opposed to even observation or ureteroscopy. And the most important factors that they cited for making this decision were degree of invasiveness, followed by the success rates in both of these scenarios. And this, this was done in Europe. I think Minaj Manga has data as well that was done in North America that nicely showed that if you have success rates for shockwave that are between 50 to 60% or greater, most patients will still be going for shockwave over ureteroscopy. This study also uh, actually was published by Dr. Forbes at Vanderbilt also looked at quality of life instruments for patients who had asymptomatic stones, uh, most of them calus seal, um, looking at patients who went for either surgery or observation. Most of the surgical patients had ureteroscopy. And they used the Wisconsin Quality of Life Questionnaire, Stone Quality Questionnaire, and they also did qualitative interviews. They showed that while there was no difference in the quality of life scores in patients who had observations or surgery, the patients who had surgery actually had a significant 40% improvement in their quality of life scores post-intervention. And I think an interesting, really interesting part of the study is it really captures some of that qualitative aspect of patient concerns when they're deciding between observation and active treatment. So I think some of these quotes really um, hit home when you look through the patient kind of journey through their stone disease. For example, this patient said, I was told it hurts worse when you pass them through. You know what I mean? you really hurt when it's coming through. Or this other patient who said, I've got a lot of trips planned and things going on. And so a little frustrating, just sitting and waiting, hoping that everything will work out. Or in favor of observation, this patient said, right now we've decided to just watch that one. It's not causing any problems. And I really don't think it's going to cause any problems. So the, I think this captures that other qualitative aspect and that art of medicine side and captures what patients are thinking as they're presented this information. So we've looked Sorry, at just a comment on that. Thanks, thanks for including that study. I think for me, participating in that study helped drive home. Uh, we often think of um, spontaneous passage of a stone as a as a benign event, and patients don't always see it that way because it can be unplanned, require a trip to the emergency department, be really disruptive to their lives. And so, just kind of bringing that home that for some people, choosing a, a planned intervention. Um, uh, even if it may, you know, you're, you're changing your stone event from, you know, 30, 40% to 100%. But having that intervention for patients who really have had a negative experience with spontaneous passage, um, uh, you know, it's all about their values and what they want. But it, it's, it's not 
spontaneous passage of a stone is not always benign from a patient perspective. Absolutely. And I think it has that headache. You need that patience. It can take several weeks. You need follow-up ultrasounds and imaging to ensure you passed it. It's not a, it's not a very benign thing, as you said. Thanks. Um, so we've looked at what patients want, and we looked a little bit on the quality of life metrics. I thought it's interesting to look at data around what Canadian urologists are doing. And some of this data is actually fairly old, but I think it's, it's interesting. This data came from University of Toronto from 2011, and they passed along surveys to urologists asking, what would you do if you had a healthy 40-year-old woman in each of the following scenarios? The ones that are relevant to our discussion today are the first two, the three millimeter upper calyx stone and the eight millimeter upper calyx seal stone. Um, interestingly, for the three millimeter stone, almost unanimously, both in actual practice and in the ideal world, almost all of the surveyed urologists would put these patients on observation, which is compatible with our data before, which said, you know, if you're less than five millimeters, uh, your risk for needing or having future stone related morbidity is lower. And then if you push the stone size to eight millimeters, then almost half of these urologists would have recommended shockwave lithotripsy. The interesting thing with that is the same group at University of Toronto looked at OHIP billing data to say, well, what are the trends for the different treatments that are actually being done in Ontario? And over the same study period as that other survey study, we see that shockwave is actually dramatically dropping. The utilization of shockwave seems to be falling. PNL is staying roughly the same, which makes sense because that's reserved for a different indication for your larger stone patients. But as we see shockwave drop, you kind of see a corresponding rise in your ureteroscopy. And you see the same sort of trend also in the United States. I thought this was interesting because we have a lot of data on the patient side that says patients are keen to pursue shockwave. We have data from surveyed urologists saying that they would do shockwave for a lot of their non-obstructing stones. But when you look at the OHIP data, um, shockwave utilization is precipitously dropping. Just something interesting, I think, to keep in mind. Next thing I want to go over is just a decision aid tool that was recently published by the University of Michigan group that I think is quite helpful in practice because it breaks down a lot of these treatment considerations for ureteroscopy versus shockwave into language that's uh, more understandable and interpretable by patients. So this is something that's available online and they break down the pros and cons of ureteroscopy compared to shockwave. And it kind of breaks it down into a chart and patients can rank, you know, what's important, what's not important, and to help them tease that apart to make a decision as to how they want to treat their stone. Which website is that on? Um, I think it's the Music Rocks website. Okay, from the University of Michigan. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. And and, we have this um, discussion with people, but, you know, we, we spend like five minutes with them. I think this is really nice for them to take home and figure this out and, you know, give them, we, we have these CUA handouts on what the, what the procedures are. I think giving them both of those to them, I think would be a great idea. This this is fantastic. I, I quite like this one. I like the language they use, like say risk of complications. Like they say that both ureteroscopy and shockwave have a low overall risk. Like that's the language they use, not like ureteroscopy high, because it's not high. It's, it's quite low. It's quite safe. But they right. say shockwave lowest risk, ureteroscopy low risk. So low. I, I quite like this one. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the last segment of the talk, I just wanted to go through some of the new technologies that are coming through in the stone world that I think might actually change how we look at stone disease over the next 10 years. One of the ones that I'm quite excited about is actually ultrasonic propulsion of stones or acoustic tractor beams to actually relocate stones. And this is work that's being done out at the University of Washington where they actually use ultrasound waves to be able to move stones from one location to the next over distances of about three to five millimeters. And I think they've actually come up as well to Vancouver and actually done some early work with us up here. So this, this is a probe that they've used for stone relocation and ultrasonic propulsion. And you can see here the ultrasound images and concurrent ureteroscopy images showing them actually relocating the stone uh, with this 
ultrasound probe. I think this is quite exciting because they've shown that you can do this without general anesthetic or sedation. You can achieve stone movement of up to five millimeters. And I think it has potential to really change how we look at stones because say if you had a patient with a UVJ stone, you can potentially say relocating that stone from the UVJ into the bladder. Or if you had a patient with a small three, four millimeter stone and they wanted to try spontaneous passage, you could maybe move that stone from an upper pole calyx down into the ureter and allow them to have a controlled trial spontaneous passage when they're ready. Or if a patient really wanted shockwave, but the stone is in the lower pole, you could maybe use this technology to shift it up to an interpole or upper pole calyx where it's a more favorable spot for shockwave. First wave is along similar sort of lines of technology, again, using ultrasound, but using ultrasound waves to achieve lithotripsy. The benefit of using burst wave is that you can do burst wave without sedation or general anesthetic, because compared to standard shockwave, shockwave, standard shockwave delivers high amplitude, but lower frequency pulses. So that's what generates the pain that requires sedation. But burst wave will allow you to have lower amplitude, but higher frequency pulsations that achieves more of a dusting sort of effect on the stone. The benefit is twofold. One, you can get more of a dusting phenomenon with smaller fragments. And second, you can do it without any sedation or general anesthetic. In one of their earlier works from 2021, they demonstrate index patients here with a preoperative CT with a seven millimeter lower pole stone. And then they performed um, uh, burst wave lithotripsy and then did a ureteroscopy after to look at the fragmentation. So here you can see that there actually was quite reasonable fragmentation with the burst wave. And you see fragments that they're not as small as what you get with ureteroscopic dusting, but they are small enough that the patient should be able to pass on their own. So it does hold good promise for this technology and quite exciting that you could see lithotripsy potentially morph into something that could be done in the office or be done even in the emergency department with a patient with acute colic. So I think it'll be quite exciting to see what this technology holds over the coming probably five years when we see more mature data come through. So um, if I can back up on that for a second there, Cyrus, um, the propulsion part is uh, still under investigation. That's not been FDA approved yet. They have done uh, a few studies um, just an experimental and, you know, done it during the reteroscopy to see if they can move stones and they can move stones. It's very interesting. And when you alter the frequency and the energy that then turns it into burst wave with the trips, which you have on the next slide. And, uh, this is a multi-center trial. Um, so, so you're right. It's led by university of Washington, but we've actually been the highest enroller in this study. So that we are taking part in this. And uh, there's 43 patients, and we actually just got this accepted into late breaking abstracts at AUA. So I'll be, be I will be presenting that, and um, you know I don't I don't think I'm allowed to give too much away yet, but it's it's very similar to Shockwave. The results are amazing, and we do it without any anesthesia, and essentially we do it actually in the bay outside of uh, the radiology suite, and patients come in. They get undressed, they, they do the thing, they could put their clothes back on and just walk out. It's really great. They don't have to be NPO. Um, they feel a little bit of tingling, but it's been really well tolerated and, and works very well. It doesn't work for everybody. It doesn't work in all stone locations and has similar limitations to ultrasound where if you can't see the stone with an ultrasound, so mid ureter, then you can't treat it. Um, so mid ureteral stones are not great. Um, upper pole stones, if the lung is in the way, is a little bit problematic because remember ultrasound waves get uh, dampened by air. So very interesting. And I think going to be, uh, uh, I think something that will come about and, you know, we can treat this in the emergency room in the office. And I think this will be a really big change. Out of curiosity on that topic, what sort of skin to stone distances are you guys treating with burst wave? So, you know, we, 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 we've gone I don't over, know if you can say, cause it's a late breaking abstract. Yeah. You know, 10 to 12, uh, we, we've gone up to for sure. Uh, and, and as expected, like shockwave, the deeper you go, the, the, the less successful it is. So it has the same kind of limitations as well too. I don't know what the limit is yet, but certainly 
for the study, we've been trying to keep it a bit lower to make sure that we um, can have some proof of success. Absolutely. So basically to, to wrap up here, I think it's fair to conclude that as we discussed before, asymptomatic renal stones carry a significant risk of stone related events over a patient's lifetime. And it'll really be upon the patient and us to work with them to decide on a strategy that involves observation, active surveillance, or ureteroscopy, or ESWL. Um, both ESWL and ureteroscopy can afford patients good stone-free rates, but they have different incidence of morbidity, albeit overall low. In general, ureteroscopy does seem to afford patients better stone-free rates for all comers compared to shockwave, but it comes at the expense of greater morbidity and possibly worse quality of life. So I think the best way to kind of end the stock is to reflect, well, what would you do if you had a stone in these different scenarios? And quite honestly, as I went through preparing this talk, I think if I had a stone that was less than four millimeters, I'd probably sit tight and observe and see what happens. Is it going to grow? Is it going to stay the same? Maybe I'm going to be in the camp that actually passes it. Who knows? Without even getting any symptoms. But I think if I had a stone that was in that four to 10 millimeter range, I, why not try ESWL? You know, it prevents me the risk of potentially, you know, being in the middle of something important and having stone-related pain, a stone-related attack. The risks are quite low. And if it doesn't work, I haven't burnt any bridges. I can try something else, including going back on observation. So with that, I thank everyone for tuning in and listening. Um, and hopefully there'll be some time for any questions and discussion.